I wanted to bring today's episode to the podcast talking all about the oral microbiome. If you are dealing with bleeding gums, you have periodontal disease, if you've got anything going on with your teeth, it is super important to address this when you're on the fertility journey. We're going to talk about how this impacts egg health, how it impacts sperm health, and why addressing the oral microbiome, there's simple techniques we can do to help improve that, and why that's so important when you're on the fertility journey. Excited for you to listen. Let's go. Hey, Katie, excited to have you back on the podcast. Hello, thank you for having me. Awesome. So I'm in my summer dress because it's warm now. <laughs> like we've come out of the deep freeze, which is which is nice. But Katie's still got a sweater on there. So is it, is it still a little chilly there in the UK? Yeah, it's quite hit and miss. Yeah, when, <laughs> when the sun's out, it's lovely, but there's a very cold wind and it's been quite cloudy. So oh, no. uh, yeah, we're not, we're, it doesn't feel like summer yet. <laughs> I know you guys get that like one month and everyone's dying because they don't have the air conditioner on. They're like, what? Uh, okay, so today we're talking all about the oral microbiome. This is an interesting one because um, I was always bragging that I've never had a cavity. I've got like these perfect teeth and um, I literally would go would be no issues i just do the cleaning and off i go and i'm very diligent like getting cleanings every every six months always have always will um i don't like them now and they're picking away but because i have like a brace thing under there where when i had braces when i was 12 they kept in that retainer piece so they're always chiseling away but um it's interesting on this because my son has got um he this is horrible but he's had like 17 cavities And literally every time I go in there, I was like a post-traumatic stress from going in with him. And then um, they're telling me another cavity, another cavity. And I got to the point where I'm like, dude, you're not brushing your teeth. I'd be like, I'm like, okay, when you brush your teeth, I'm going to give you 20 bucks. And and the dentist will come out. He gets his 20 bucks. He didn't have his cavity. So, you know, he's got, you know, a bunch of food sensitivities and things like that. Um, And so like the health of the microbiome being over the gut, with the vaginal side of things, obviously for women, for, for the, like the oral side of things, when you've got something going on and you're, you're with your mouth, it, it, it does impact the rest of your body. So today we wanted to really dig into that piece and see, you know, is that a clue that's being missed for you when you're on the fertility journey? So yeah, what's the, the, the research here telling us, Katie, well, first of all, like, yeah, the oral microbiome, I think we've heard about the gut microbiome. We've talked about the vaginal microbiome, like the oral microbiome. Like, what is that? Yeah. Um, and I, that's, that's a really good place to start because, um, yes, I think, um, most, most people know what we mean by the gut microbiome now, although I have to say it always surprises me because uh, obviously this this is a focal point uh, part of our work and often I will ask new clients do you know what I mean by gut microbiome and I'll just assume they know and I would say still like it's 50 50 some people yeah. know and some people have no idea what I'm talking about so um I think it's easy as clinicians to assume that 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 people know what you mean so Really, the, the the microbiome on the whole, on the whole is thinking um, about the array of microorganisms that dwell on or in our bodies, um, and we know that our that, that our own cells to bacterial or other microorganisms, you know, they they outnumber us by a hell of a lot. Um, I can't remember the exact ratios, but it's um, you know we, we we are more bug than we are human cells, that's for sure. Um, and really, those the the the, the colonization of those what we call collectively the the microbiome or sometimes the microbiota they have the capacity to help or hinder our health so when we're thinking about the gut for example we know that lots of uh, microbes in the gut can help um with our immune system and, and regulation and with our hormone metabolism and all, all sorts of other things are linked with our mood and and all sorts um and uh conversely if if there is dysregulation if there is dysbiosis um or an imbalance in those microbes then they can cause health problems like mainly uh, around inflammation um because they're they're infections at the end of the day okay so um really i guess the first thing with the oral microbiome is to note that if we're acknowledging the importance of the gut microbiome 
that comes from somewhere, right? And the, the gut microbiome comes from what we put into our bodies. Like, yes, people are are born with a microbiome of some description, um, but really what that microbiome turns into during the course of a lifespan really is dependent on what you're putting inside your body. Um, and where does food reach, first and foremost? It's the mouth, right? Um, and so uh, it makes sense that there is that there exists a microbiome within our mouth as well. And in a lot of respects, the mouth is um, it's, it's it's kind of a bit like um, I often think of it a bit like the moat surrounding the castle. Like you know, it's it's almost there doing a bit of a protective um, job, but, and it's and it's the first line of defence in a lot of ways. And this is why. Um, uh, again, like the next part down, this is why the stomach acid is so important. And we talk a lot about stomach acid in the context of digestion, because one of the most important roles of that stomach acid is to kill off some of the more harmful harmful, or the pathogenic bacteria that might be coming via the, the mouth, via the oral cavity. So the oral um, microbiome, uh, we we didn't really know that much about, and there's been you know more research coming into this over the last um, I don't know how long, but certainly in, in recent years, and we're now drawing all sorts of associations um, between um, the, the the oral microbiome, i.e., the, the the bacteria or other species that live in the mouth, and things like Alzheimer's disease is a big one um a huge one um but also i and i guess perhaps more pertinent to this audience is for pregnancy outcomes and fertility outcomes and who would have thunk it right that that the bacteria in your mouth could somehow impact your fertility or your pregnancy outcomes i mean that when i first found out about this that was wild to me that notion um but but it's really interesting mm-hmm. and so let's uh yeah fascinating right and like i don't know i've it's yeah, it is to, to, like, it's all connected. Right. And if you're born via C-section, like my kids were, if you were like me, um, like I, I didn't have this, but my kids had like a lot of ear infections and strep throat. And so I gave them a lot of antibiotics and then lo and behold, you know, my son, you know, has a predisposition to, to oral issues. Right. And he had brace, yeah. even the braces piece, right. Where that side of things, lots of do you can prevent braces with instead of you know they're like those orthodontists are just like raking it in my guy the, 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 the guy in our local town's got two clinics and driving around a mercedes and he had a client appreciation meeting and he filled like six movie theaters with kids to say thank you very much and i'm like wow this guy is just raking in the bucks so um yeah. So lots of things to do for prevention and kind of, you know, what's, what's happening in our mouths. And I, like I had braces, my, my brother had braces, you know, I've got food sensitivities and gut issues. My brother's got a whole bunch of other kinds of health issues going on as well. So let's, um, so let's sort of talk about anything else you'd like to share with, um, we sort of talked about like the general, like health implications, but let's kind of like dig into here where our audience wants to know more about the, the, piece around conception and really why that's super important when you're on the fertility journey um, prior and then pregnancy with the oral microbiome. Yeah, yeah. And I guess there's 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 two um different things or two different mechanisms going on here that, that are worth noting. And when we're thinking about the um fertility piece and the the trying to conceive Really, what we're looking at in terms of the underlying drivers here, and this is a theme that I know comes up for you time and time again, Sarah, and and has come up for us in the past, is is inflammation. And we know that when it comes to so many health outcomes, fertility issues included in that, if we look to the underlying causes and what's actually going on and what's driving those issues – inflammation can explain so much because when the body is under strain and is uh, in an inflammatory state it's on high alert and and it thinks it's under threat and it will be prioritizing that over anything else um and so really when we've got a dysbiosis or, 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 you know, low lying infections in the mouth. And we may or may not be aware of these. Like a lot of the time we, 
uh, we might have, uh, yeah, we might know, I know you've mentioned in, in, in your son's case, like the, the repeat cavities and these kind of things. So, you know, perhaps a weakening of the tooth enamel um, might suggest that there could be a dysbiosis in the mouth. Um, but also if, you know, and, and so many people just live with these things and don't really think much of it. But if you're the kind of person that when you floss or when you brush your teeth too vigorously, your gums bleed, that's not normal. Like, yes, gums are very vascular. And so, it does, you know, the, 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 the blood is just behind the surface of the skin. But it, you shouldn't be bleeding that much when you're doing your routine oral hygiene. And if you are, then that is a sign that there's inflammation going on. And inflammation is it's an immune response in response to some kind of real or perceived invasion. And, and the invasion in this case is the bacteria um, or the other microbes that are residing in the mouth. Um, so if that is you and you struggle with, you know, if you get uh, sores in your mouth, like ulcer you know, um, ulcers can be another one. Um, and, um, uh, sometimes even, um, uh, what they called now the like, uh, tonsil stones, uh, as well, uh, for people who get like the, the not tonsillitis, but like little, almost like a buildup of, of plaque in the, in the, in their throat. And mm-hmm. um, they can all be signs that there is possibly some, some dysbiosis going on in the mouth. Now, the reason this is linked to fertility and, and trying to conceive is it comes back down to this inflammatory piece. Um, and we know that when there is inflammation going on in the body, um, that, that that it can it can have a influence our hormonal cascade. So, for example, the um, gonadotropic releasing hormone, GnRH, in, in the brain that triggers the release of luteinizing hormone that's integral to actually telling our ovaries to release an egg and to ovulate. Those those systems are connected. So if those if inflammation is high, then GnRH might not be um, working as well as what it should, which can impact uh, our ability to ovulate. Um, and there is some research that that periodontal disease, just periodontal disease with no other factors involved, uh, could could lengthen the time to conceive by as much as two months. Now that might not seem very long, depending on how long you've been on your journey. But if we think about just that one. One factor yeah. in amongst everything else that we know could be impacting fertility and um, it's 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 a big deal mm-hmm. absolutely and uh yeah it's interesting so many people we're focusing you know with helping people with low amh and high fsh i can't tell you the number of people when we're doing case studies and looking back i'm like oh they had bleeding gums they had ulcers in their mouth they had the canker sores like there was something going on in the, the oral microbiome i know for sure if i get glutened or if I have a food that doesn't agree with me, I literally, my gums will start bleeding and my nose will just kind of bleed a little bit too. Like just that look. And before it would be like a chronic thing. Um, that I didn't even realize it went on for a while. And I'm like, Oh, how we come on flossing? I'm like, there's blood there. Yeah. It shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way. Um, and what about the pregnancy outcomes? What are we, what are we seeing there? Yeah, so so I think the the thing um, of note really when it comes to pregnancy and the oral microbiome is that what we found out through the research is that um, certain strains of bacteria that are often connected to the oral microbiome and found in the oral microbiome have the ability to cross the placental barrier and then cause disruptions to a pregnancy. Um, and this, we know this because of studies that have looked into um, uh, pl- pl- placental tissue um, and, and umbilical cord samples. Um, and so it's this this is this is notable when it comes to pregnancy um, because. <sighs> Again, we're 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 yet to understand the full picture and the mechanisms here, but it's um, associated with things like preterm labour, um, premature rupture of membranes, preeclampsia, pregnancy loss, um, intrauterine growth retardation, low birth weight, neonatal sepsis, so after the baby's born, and even stillbirth. Um, So these are 
all they're all really significant things and and they're often the kind of things that you know when you're striving to get pregnant and that's all you want and then you're pregnant you breathe this sigh of relief and you know you don't ever think that those bad things will happen to you um but actually this is just a part of your health picture in terms of overall right and so um and this is a lot of the time why why people who are pregnant as part of their antenatal care and from their midwives they're often asked about their oral health and here in the UK we're we're given um access to free de- dental treatment during pregnancy um, and encouraged to use that. So, you know, we do we do know about these connections between oral health and, um, and pregnancy outcomes. And it's interesting, too, even like when we're doing our stool testing, we were just looking at one the other day and that um, that the fusobacterium came up on there and we were all like, oh, or, you know, oral microbiome. Let's look to see what's what's happening there with the, with that client. So can you just talk about that, like seeing some of that stuff, like when we're from a clinical standpoint? Um, yes. So usually um, I think f- far, far more routinely practitioners will be doing stool, stool testing than they would all microbiome testing. Um, and I guess there's there's just a few clues um, that that we have, uh, and um, one of them is um, if this specific species, the the Fusobacterium nucleatum, comes up in the stools, that is one that is known to be a problematic. Um, uh bacteria in in the mouth in the oral cavity and it's known to originate from there so usually if it's found in the gut microbiome it can be part of a commensal bacteria in in low numbers but if it creeps up then we know that probably that's translocated from the mouth um and then we just want to be really really mindful of that and probably um going in quite rigorously with some oral health recommendations for that individual yeah, because I guess it can be it can be transferred to the placenta and the fetus via the um, yeah through that that period, periodontal disease. So making mm-hmm. sure, like like you say, in the UK they're offering that. I guess the Brits are known as having those bad teeth. I don't know if that's still the case. My uh, my dad's British and he's got fabulous teeth, but he was like very very rigorous about his his hygiene. He's like Sarah, brush your teeth. Mario, that's why I have a thing with the brushing the teeth. I never like even if I'm like exhausted. I'm like, I always brush my teeth before I go to bed. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, anything there on, I guess, because yeah, this could be a little bit scary where we're like, oh, wait, this is like some serious outcomes from this. So it is all part of like looking at everything. Right. And so, um, and not like, yeah, can you kind of share, I guess, because it's sort of those, sort of those the periodontal disease and then all those kind of adverse outcomes that could be anything, anything you want to share there for people? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, we, we have to be really mindful here that we're using um, some terms and words here that are actually really scary. And um, it's important to note that there's there's a lot yet to be understood um, about these, these, these mechanisms. Um, but I guess just the most important thing to, to be aware of is that if these, if these bacteria exist within the mouth and they're there and they're there in abundance and then there, a pregnancy occurs, then there is the potential for them to cross the placental barrier. Um, and if they do that, then really the, those same kind of inflammatory responses that we spoke about before can be happening in the in uterine environment and, and and in the fetal tissue um and and can cause can cause damage now that's not to say that everyone who has oral health issues is going to have adverse pregnancy outcomes that's that's not what we're saying at all um it's just that we associations have been drawn we're yet to understand more um but if the associations have been drawn for me that's enough to want to you know work on it and really when it comes to oral health and oral hygiene we'll, we'll talk about some of the things we can be doing um in a moment but this isn't this isn't hard stuff this no. isn't um you know this this is stuff that can be easily uh, integrated into your daily routine so it's not you know it's, we're not talking about a complete lifestyle overhaul here and any other bacteria here that we're we're seeing in there for um 
There's, yeah, yeah. So, so a couple of others provisionally. So, so it's P. I, I can never pronounce the bacteria species. There's so many uh, weird and wonderful words. But P. gingivalis. Um, so that that comes from that that association with gingivitis. Um, and Bergiella bacteria are both uh, specific species that have been connected to adverse pregnancy outcomes as well. Um, so you know, really, really, as I say, this isn't about. Um, I think we've got enough to be scared about in this world. This isn't about getting becoming more fearful. Um, mm-hmm. It's just about thinking, oh, okay, well, if we know these associations exist, um, it's just a really good reason to get on top of our, our oral hygiene. Yeah, and like we said, a lot of this we can see from the stool and then also looking at the health history, right? Where we're talking, we're asking about your 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 uh, dental health. Uh, on yeah. there as well so um, and I've always really liked that about the the fab, uh, fertile um, health history form is that you do ask those questions in detail mm-hmm. yeah because your fertility clinic is not going to be asking about the health of your teeth it's just not something that they're going to look at right and we're you know we're not anti-IVF we're pro-health let's work on your health that's going to improve the chances of you know of this working so there's the there's the stool testing looking at the DNA the stool that we can see some indicators in there and then also there are oral microbiome testing. Anything you want to say there about the testing? Um, yeah, so we we we're very lucky to um, have have a company here in, in the UK um, um, called, called Invivo. They're they're fantastic, and they're they're um, they they're, they've led the way in a lot of ways around the the microbiome research and testing here in the UK. Um, so we yeah that, that if for anyone any UK based listeners that is a potential option um I'm I don't I'm not as familiar about the what's available in the states but um it's possible to get the oral microbiome looked at um but I think really the most important thing to note is that um the the prevention and the the care is is the most important aspect here right um, and then, so this is not just about women, it's also about men. So let's talk about how this, um, the oral microbiome can impact sperm health. Yeah. So again, there's, there's been some, some provisional bits of research, um, around the sperm health in men. So coming back to this piece around periodontal disease, um, and, and, and sperm health. So there's been associations whereby men with periodontal disease have been shown to have worse sperm parameters. Um, and it's, it's just to say, um, that, men with fertility issues have also again that that kind of double association that men with fertility issues have um also been more likely to have the identification of a pathogenic bacteria in the mouth so um again it's i would say that there's there's a lot of scope for more uh, research in this area because at the moment it's it's associations, but certainly there there are associations there in the literature so far. Um, and similarly, um, in terms of erectile function, even so, not just thinking about sperm health, um, but in terms of erectile function, it, again, this this association with periodontal disease. Um, uh, so men with periodontal disease have been shown to be almost three times. More more likely to experience erectile dysfunction um, and this is thought to be linked with blood uh, blood flow blood vessels and again that that piece around chronic chronic inflammation um impacting blood flow essentially so there's all the bad news so let's talk about like what we can do to actually improve this because this can be you know some simple fixes right um just to get yourself into a routine of, of doing this so the, there's lots of, um, you know, dietary recommendations. I was just, yeah, even, even, um, just reading the other day, even kind of doing a paleo gluten-free diet, um, you may not need to get your, uh, cause they recommend every six months to get your, your checkup. And they say people with that, you can go maybe a year or 18 months, but then like, are you very, you know, how strict are you on that? And if you kind of, sometimes we kind of go outside of it. So it still is the regular recommendation, um, and this is actually from Dr. Mark uh, Berhana. He was on um, my podcast episode uh, talking all about sleep apnea and, and, and how the health of the oral microbiome is impacting your sleep. Um, mm-hmm. So he, he was saying that recommendation where, you know, you have a cleaner diet, 
Um, but then, you know, how is again, it's sort of that caveat in there. So what are, what are some of the um, recommendations then for you know, a diet that's going to be good for oral health? Like obviously taking out inflammatory foods would be number one. Yeah, it, like definitely thinking about inflammatory foods. Um, it's also this thing around and, and you're bringing memories back for me now, Sarah, of like the messaging that we have when we're kids. And I do I remember um one thing my mum used to tell me when I was a kid is like sh- sugar, sugar rots your teeth, right? Sugar yeah. eats eats your teeth, essentially. Um, and a lot of that, it's not that sugar itself rots your teeth. It's to do with the microbiome and sugar feeds bacteria that will then go on to erode uh, enamel, erode the gums and all of those things. And so um, it's it's always worth bearing in mind that usually opportunistic and pathogenic bacteria, they, they love glucose, they, and and they love all things sugary. And so if we're um, eating sugar on on a regular basis, um, then likely you're going to be feeding um, the, you know, the wrong type of bacteria in, in, in your oral microbiome. Um, Conversely, if you're eating a diet that is kind of lower on the glycemic index scale as a whole um, and eating foods that are high in the mineral dense, um, so, you know, a wide range of of, 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 um, of vegetables and plant foods, all the different colors with all the different polyphenols and antioxidants in there, um, that, that is an anti-inflammatory diet, right? And um, similarly, uh, you know, really good um, quality protein, like, yeah, grass-fed, beef, diet, dairy, seafood, et cetera. Um, healthy fats in there. We always talk a lot about healthy fats. Um, so thinking about um, healthy oils like extra virgin olive oil, avocado oil, uh, and then even things like coconut oil, ghee, fatty fish, um, like salmon, anchovies, sardines, those kind of fish, um, nuts and seeds, um, and and uh, grass-fed meat, importantly, um, gra- grass-fed meat over, you know, soy or any other kind of uh, fed meat um and then as many non-starchy veggies in your diet as possible um and and we always think about um uh we always think about those kind of fibrous foods i guess as as good for feeding the gut microbiome which it is um it's also helpful for the oral microbiome in terms of feeding the good bugs that we want to be in there. But equally, it's like if you think about fiber rich foods that you have to chew on a lot, um, that like that kind of acts as a natural um, cleaning mechanism. Right. Um, and it's it's if you imagine like dogs, I mean, they, dogs don't eat much fiber. But if you imagine dogs with bones and they they gnaw on the bones and that naturally helps to clean their teeth. Now, we're not bone gnawers by a species, but um, one one, you know, one way that that can help is by eating food that you have to chew a lot um, because it helps it helps to um, to, 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 to clean those. Um, vitamin K rich foods can be helpful as well. And this is uh, going into the, uh, the the scope of eating liver, um, which which we, we love um, and um, eggs, uh, grass fed butter um, and, and and then just really basic things like drinking water, <laughs> keeping hydrated. Right. Um, and not relying on sugary drinks. I know a lot of people. I don't know how popular this is over there, Sarah, and in the States, but tons of people over here drink squash um so like diluted squash fruit juice, juice. yeah yeah um, squash, squash is like the isn't that an orange drink you guys have no yeah yeah exactly like an always uh, there are tons of different flavors you can get orange squash lemon squash barley squash all you know all sorts of squashes but they're they're loaded with sugar and or artificial sweeteners um and you know really they're they're, 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 they're no good um for that Conversely, uh, in terms of talking about sweeteners, there is one type of sweetener, uh, a natural sweetener that there is some early research into as being protective. Um, It's not often that I advocate chewing gum, but if you are going to chew gum, then chewing a a xylitol and chewing gum, sugar-free xylitol gum, that 
there's some evidence that that can help to remineralize the teeth um, and, um, and, and help be supportive of a healthy oral microbiome. Just back to the dog thing. My dog is, she must be fancy. Anyways, she's a small breed, a cotton detulier, a little white ball of fluff. Um, I was brushing her teeth, doing all this stuff, goes in last year and had to have extractions $2,500 later where they took out, they left her canines, but they took out, I, they thought they'd be taking out two teeth and they call me and say, we're removing 15 teeth out of her little mouth. And she's only like, it was only five at the time. And that's why I have, I have an issue with teeth. And then, so she was in there for the surgery. I'm like, oh my God. And then I'm like, okay, I want to make sure this dog's teeth, because I guess the dogs have a certain, the same amount of teeth, no matter how, like how small, how big a dog is. So a little dog have a smaller mouth and then they're crowded um, found out that she had, uh, so now again, next year, and she's like, okay, they're starting to, you know, have problems again, again, $800 for a, a, a dog cleaning where she had to go and get the tartar scraped off. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Anyways. So, um, I even have a dog that has, um, you know, oral microbiome issues, even though she has a special, <laughs> special bone for chewing. She has, wipes and dental brushes it doesn't seem to matter anyways um yeah um i put probiotics on her food um but yeah that 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 xylitol um gum you know it's it doesn't last as long you might well chew it sometimes you know you have the other the regular stuff and you're like you can taste the taste for eight ages xylitol you're like five minutes throw it in the garbage yeah. but <laughs> but you know if, if it's and then i guess also there's issues if you're chewing gum and then maybe that can impact your gut health and give gas and bloating all that sort of stuff but i guess kind of some um, recommendations like we talk about mouth taping um so if you're snoring mouth hanging open it's dry that can um that can impact your your oral gut health cardiovascular health a whole bunch of things um mm -hmm. you want to i think we all know we got to brush brush and floss regularly um, you know, the flossing piece, people maybe kind of fall apart on that. I guess there's those, um, water picks and things like that. You can go down a, like a rabbit hole doing that. Um, and then like I, I think about what, what, what important thing to note there, Sarah, I'm just going uh, yeah. to interrupt to, to introduce concept as well that we haven't mentioned so far in, in this context, which is when we're thinking about the oral microbiome, one significant piece of the equation is is this thing around biofilms and um, and so a, a biofilm is formed it's it's a biofilm is almost a matrix like structure that that wouldn't be really visible to the naked eye um but it's formed when there is a dysbiosis of bacteria in in the gut or in the mouth or anywhere um and what can happen then is that those um the, those those pathogenic or those uh, opportunities opportunistic bacterial species will clump together and form these biofilms um, and, and, it, and it acts as a house essentially and so it means that more bacteria than can then get caught in that structure um, and so a lot of what we do a, a lot of you know again thinking about the gut when we're doing client gut protocols uh, one of the primary things that we're thinking about there is often biofilm disruptors and there are certain um, uh, products there are certain um uh certain things I can't think of a technical term but things that, that 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 can help to disrupt and bust those biofilms now in the mouth we're actually very fortunate because we we have direct access to the mouth and we you know we can brush our teeth and and, and um we can mechanically disrupt those biofilms and, and the way that we do that is by brushing flossing and you know if you've got a water pick brilliant like any anything like that it literally helps to disrupt those biofilms and reduce the likelihood that they can form yeah and then the cleanings making sure you go regularly sometimes people will go for years and years without getting that clean so like schedule in the regular cleanings i've moved here and i had the same dentist since i was a kid and now i got this new dentist I, I have to say, I'm just not like loving this. I don't know. They go in there. They're, I'm like, dudes, I have nothing wrong with my mouth. Why are you trying to upsell me to the, all this kind of nonsense? I'm like, I'm like, I got to change my dentist. But anyway, there's a little dentist rant. But um, um, yeah, find one that you that you like. And this was like a biological dentist as well, which oh, which really? are you know, which is good. But I don't know. Um, okay, and so get your cleanings. Scrape your tongue. Get a tongue scraper. Anything you want to mm -hmm. say about the tongue scraper? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's again, it's it's a bit of a lost art. Um, tongue scraping or even just brushing uh, your, your your tongue as well um but again it's it's thinking about that that biofilm disrupt disruption and just build um reducing the buildup um of, of, of bacteria it's a, it's as simple as that really anything we can be doing to gently um disrupt things in 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 the mouth yeah and the conventional mouthwash which is like filled with alcohol so like it's like you know I think during uh the pandemic they're talking about yeah using was like a really high strength listerine to like blast out any of the the virus that was in the mouth um it was like the brown one i think they had recommended so my husband's down there practically drinking the whole bottle i'm like what's going on here mm-hmm. so um but yeah there's all sorts of you go to whole foods or any, you know, your natural health food store and you'll get um uh mouthwashes that are not gonna like it's, it's the same thing of you kill all the good and the bad bo- um bugs anything you want to say there yeah, and and I guess it's it's this thing of we live in you know a, a, a super clean world where we're obsessed with being super clean, and um, this whole I mean, there's so many products. How many products do you see on the shelves in the supermarket where it's like, oh, uh, you know, it kills ninety nine point nine percent of germs, and we're so terrified of germs um, that actually this over cleanliness and these sterile environments that we've created ourselves that are in a lot of ways you know we, we think that that's probably contributing to the rise of aller- sorry the rise of allergies and all sorts of other things like that so um it's yeah it's it's <laughs> um that's I guess a story for another time but it's the same concept of we don't wiping everything out there's a happy medium here and and there are good bacteria as well as bad and so yes we want to keep things clean but we don't want to completely wipe everything out because if we think about uh, and we always describe the gut microbiome like this um if we think about the gut microbiome like a lawn and we want a really nice healthy full lawn and those are all the bacteria that are helpful for our body it, the more gaps there are in that lawn the more scope there is for the weeds to come in. And so whilst we, you know, we we want to do what we can to get rid of the weeds, we don't want to just leave a load of empty space because that's where there's then space for weeds to come in. So we do want to, um, yes, I know we've been talking a lot about getting rid of bacteria here and cleaning and all those kind of things, but equally as important is actually getting the right balance of good bacteria in that oral cavity as well back on, on the, the little lawn thing, as I go for a walk around here, I can't tell you that I'm like the other neighborhood I was in, everybody was like very fastidious about their lawn here. There's like weeds growing people's lawn. My husband's out there. He's very, very uh, particular about the lawn. He's fertilizing, watering, making it this beautiful green carpet. Other people have got lot, like, like six foot weeds in their, <laughs> in their lawn, Danny lights, all this their stuff. And I'm like, what, what's happening? Um, but yeah, there you go. If you don't, you're not tending to it, st- things go wild. Um, and then oil, oil. Here at the moment, there's a, there's a big drive over here for people um, leaving their lawns actually to try to try and help save the bees. So there's a, there's a big thing about like not mowing your grass too much at the moment. Yeah. And I guess, yeah, here you can't be throwing on like all the, like the pesticides and all that, all the mm. stuff too. They ban, ban that piece, which is, which is good. Right. Cause you got the little dog going around smelling all these lawns and then getting glyphosate in their little, you know, wonder why dogs are dying, dying of cancer. It's like, Oh my God. Um, and oil pulling. I, I was on an oil pulling kick for a while. Uh, you don't really need to do it that, that long. I remember I was like, I, I take the, the coconut oil and swish it while I was in the shower, I come out. And then, and then I was like, Ooh, I'm going to just spit it in the sink. No, we don't spit it in the sink. It hardens. Then it'll plug your drains. You got to spit it because my husband and I were doing it. We're like, what's happening? We're going to plug the drains. So yeah, it could be, it can be really helpful that, and actually make your teeth really white. It's um, pretty cool. So uh, oil pulling, there's, you can go down a rabbit hole on the internet of all kinds of stuff to tell you how to do oil pulling. Anything you want to say there? Yeah, and and again, it's 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 because the oil, the coconut oil, is um, is naturally antimicrobial um, and and anti-inflammatory, um, and and it also helps to promote a healthy uh, microbial balance as well. So it can be quite a nice thing to do, um, and also, you know, I I think what I uh, one thing I recommend a lot for my clients now is like use probiotic 
oral care products. So, you know, you can get probiotic toothpaste now, you can get probiotic mouthwashes. And um, like uh, I often recommend one that is, it's a it's a powder and you just mix the powder with some water and you use it like a mouthwash and it's probiotic. And it's, you know, it literally helps to put in some of those bacteria that we want to see. Um, so there's all sorts of ways now that we can actually help to promote um, that really healthy oral space. And, and, and again, Again, as we said at the start, none of them are that out there. It's, you know, most of these things can just be added in to what you're already doing. Like, you know, most of us are brushing our teeth, um, I'd like to think. Um, so, you know, if, if you are brushing your teeth, then like, great, let's habit stack on that um, and just say, okay, this is my two, three minutes where I'm doing my oral care every day. And yes, that might look like swishing a bit of coconut oil in your mouth for a moment, or it might be um, using a probiotic mouthwash or other product. It might be flossing, um, but just getting it, getting it done. Yeah. And get a, um, like a non-toxic toothpaste as well. And you don't want to have it filled with fluoride and stuff like that, which is, Mm -hmm. which is good. And there's tons of options out there that actually work. Cause in the beginning there, you, you try them and you're like, Oh my goodness, it's like horrible, but there's tons of options that work. But any final thoughts today on fertility as someone's on the fertility journey and the oral microbiome? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's just to note that, um, rather than, this feeling like oh another thing to worry about because I know that at the start there was a, you know quite a bit of scary talk going on there it's it's just like it's just to know it's just to be aware that this is a part of the puzzle and um, if you know that you've got oral health issues and you're trying to get pregnant or you struggle to stay pregnant then it's it's an avenue that is worth considering in terms of thinking okay what can I do to up my game a bit here and it might be worth them working with a practitioner to actually help guide you through some more specific um protocols for you um to, to, to help you through that absolutely awesome 